Okay, I think I'm in action now. So um, thank you again for the invitation. So I'm going to just um, talk about the ethical and legal and some of the social aspects around stratification. Um, and Hilary mentioned that at the PhD Foundation, um, we do a range of work, and I lead the humanities work at the foundation. Um, some of it is project-based, and I'm going to say a little bit more about the EPIC CVD project, which is looking at um, the implications of uh, incorporating genomic information into CVD risk stratification. I'm going to talk about that later. Some of it's very much based on technology, such as genome sequencing, or legal concepts, such as anonymization. And we also focus a lot on practical aspects, so we, we've done lots of work around data sharing. And so I'm going to allude to that as well, and I think that's very relevant. The issues and challenges that arise around data sharing are very relevant, as Chris has just, just mentioned. What we also do, and I'm mentioning this too, is work on the um, contextual aspects of um, uh, healthcare and research. So in connection with the in vitro diagnostic devices regulation, we've been leading work with the Wellcome Trust and the ESHG. Um, to oppose amendments that are being brought in um, at European level um, that will impact on the way that genetic tests can be prescribed and offered. Um, and we've also been working on data protection. And again, these, these European developments um, are likely to have a profound impact on the way that healthcare and research is delivered. So I've chosen in my um, presentation to use a, strat a, a, a definition of stratification that um, we pointed at in a paper that we wrote a few years ago um, that Trushelm uh, et al. Have, um, ha have suggested, i.e. matching therap therapies with specific patient population characteristics using clinical <clears throat> biomarkers. So um, this diagram just shows that stratified medicine is one of a number of different terms that are used, sometimes interchangeably and also by different stakeholder groups. And you heard Hillary talking about the wider uh, issues around personalization earlier this morning. So I'm not going to talk specifically about using um, companion diagnostics to target drug, drug therapy. I'm going to talk more about um, accessing genotype information and how that's used to stratify populations um, for different interventions. So I want to give a very quick, um, quick and dirty uh, view of um, what ethical, legal and social issues are. Um, and as far as ethical issues are concerned, I think these are around the philosophical principles of autonomy, of non-maleficence, so that's not doing harm, um, of beneficence, doing good, and also issues around fairness and justice. And I think when we're thinking about stratification, issues around justice, distributive justice, are very important. And of course, the legal issues that arise are partly those that are, are formalized through regulations, um, and they're issues that are familiar to us, such as safeguarding privacy and confidentiality, um, issues around data sharing, consent, access, uh, and as we were just talking about, commercialization and IP. And the broader issues are more, um, the societal issues are broader, um, and they, um, you reach those through thinking about these aspects through a range of institutions and minorities um, and individuals. And at the foundation, PhD foundation, we try and look at the uh, implementation of new technologies um, and look at these regulatory issues from these variety of different perspectives, often by involving a whole host of stakeholders in our work. So I think one of the main issues that, um, that uh, the ethical issues that is very important um, when you think about stratified medicine is the issue around transparency. Um, and this is because I think using a, a, a measure that has a lack of transparency actually raises issues around distributive justice, which I mentioned. So those sort of worries that fears to of accessing an intervention or a drug perhaps, um, that, that isn't provided equitably. I think um, 
a lack of transparency might also um, raise issues around autonomy. So these are issues around individuals being able to um, assess their own needs and make their own decisions in healthcare. So a lack of transparency might disenfranchise individuals. And also there, of course, there are issues around paternalism, the extent to which um, clinicians or institutions or organi organization guidance, such as NICE, for example, um, might make decisions that if they're not got, if they're not transparent, that they'd be paternalistic, and um, prevent people being properly informed. And I think transparency is important because um, a lack of information about why um, resources are allocated also goes to a sense of accountability. And if there's a sense of accountability, um, that encourages trustworthiness. And Chris described very well how he'd engaged with a range of stakeholders um, backed up with um, complicated sort of data access committees where um, all the obligations and <coughs> responsibilities are set out of different parties. Um, but that builds a sense of accountability um, and trustworthiness from all, all relevant stakeholders. So the work that I'm just about to describe isn't a review of the scientific and uh, scientific and clinical validity and utility around stratification. It's more an assessment of the ethical, legal, and social issues that might arise. So I'm going to describe two projects. The first was um, a project that I think Hillary mentioned, the COGS project, which was part of a big Framework 7 funded um, project uh, which sought to use the results of primary research to evaluate the potential of stratification, of population stratification, um, looking at individual risk of breast, ovarian and prostate cancer. And lots of other groups were evaluating the potential of that information to reduce the incidence and mortality from these cancers um, through risk stratification and tar targeting um, subgroups. But our work involved looking at the key organisational, <coughs> ethical, legal and social is issues that might arise from such programmes and making policy recommendations. So we, did a, we, we reviewed a, a range of different factors, and I've listed some of these here. Um, I suppose what I'd like to point out are um, particularly issues around the genetic testing of children, um, returning unsolicited um, information to, um, to those screened, um, and issues around those low-risk groups, so issues who weren't offered an intervention or a drug as a result of, of the um, biomarker assessment, in this case the genotype assessment. And in COGS, we were particularly looking at breast cancer, and we were very conscious that the current situation uses age as a threshold for inviting people for mammogram. And what we were proposing and thinking about was a, 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 um, an alternative uh, measure which used a combination of genotype, age, and other risk factors to use that as a basis for invitation. So actually managing that low-risk group and their expectations and assumptions is, is, is very important. We also um, did some work on the sort of infrastructure for testing, both for um, bringing together the diverse sorts of information that might be needed to make a risk assessment, um, but also the, the, we, we explored the way that such a resource would be structured and funded, and what it would, um, what its actions would need to, how, how it how it be managed. So, of course, there are a number of different alternatives um, for structuring such a, a, a resource, um, and this diagram just suggests that, I mean, you could have one big database that you ask multiple questions of through an individual's lifetime uh, about their susceptibility for a variety of different diseases. Or you could prospectively target um, individuals in the light of a variety of different risk factors. Um, and 
those sorts of models would be likely to need to aggregate a variety of different sorts of data. Um, and we also um, considered the, the situation where within a population you might repeatedly test but dispose of samples and only keep the risk score um, as and when required. And in comparing those different models, we observed that obviously repeated testing and disposal is less logistically challenging um, and it's less ethically controversial, but it, obviously it's more wasteful of resources in the longer term, um, but there are decreasing costs with economies of scale. But if you're talking about building some big resource where you're keeping samples and data, um, there are obviously um, added problems of the additional curation that's needed, the data security, and also the risks of identification through increased storage and sharing um, of data. So I'm just going to pick out a few of our recommendations from the COGS project. Um, and the first was that in the short term, we recommended that any risk stratified population the population program has to have a clearly defined purpose and that the storage and linkage of samples and data should be minimized. And here we're talking about identifiable data and identifiable samples. And we've, we also suggested that the genotyping for multiple conditions, um, especially involving the lifetime storage of samples or data, shouldn't currently, currently be introduced. And that was partly because of our concerns around um, accessing samples from um, healthy newborn children and keeping them across a lifetime. Um, and those concerns arose for two reasons. Partly from an ethical point of view that actually taking samples from children and testing them for a range of conditions um, would compromise their own um, ability to make their own decisions. Um, later in, in, in life, so especially testing for adult onset conditions. Um, the, the, the ethical standards that have been applied and the, the ethical consensus is that children should not be tested for adult onset conditions. Um, they should be able to make their own decision. So this was one of the reasons. We also um, explored the sorts of consent that should be given um, or should be used when taking samples for genotyping as part of a population program. And um, we argued that the benefits, harms and uncertainties of, of genotyping and, and risk assessment should be included as part of the consent process. And we argued that where possible, um, an encompassing or broad consent should be used, which took account of reasonable and foreseeable future developments. Of course, since making these recommendations, um, I'll say a little bit more about it in a minute, but there have been um, advances at European level with the data protection regulation. And the data protection um, regulation requires for, for wh where you're processing data that um, is genetic data, that you need uh, an explicit consent and so it may be that some of the broad consents that um, are currently be re being relied on um, would not be valid under the new um, European regime and I think the data pr protection regulation like the in vitro diagnostic devices regulation is currently being reviewed in the European um, between the European Parliament the Council and the Commission. It's in trilogue at the moment. So it's not clear um, precisely what the EU will, um, what form the EU regulation will ultimately take. <coughs> but it may be that the sort of broad consent model that we had in mind when we did this work just a couple of years ago would not be possible, will not be possible once the EU regulation, data protection regulation is. Um, introduced. So I've already mentioned um, some of the issues that arise around identifying individuals for screening. 
um, the issues that arise around communication with with low risk risk groups. So that's risks who are um, seen as being at low risk of um, developing um, a disease if we're thinking about um, breast and, and prostate cancer. And there are obviously logistical issues around the timing and frequency of recall and issues around engaging with that low risk group if you're just um, proposing an intervention that's going to happen um, on an infrequent or infrequent basis. So I've included electronic patient records here um, because I think there are issues um, around the use of electronic <coughs> patient records, um, the extent to which they offer fair representation of, of vulnerable, <coughs> vulnerable groups, the extent to which patients are able to make consent about how their records will be used, and of course issues around holding, accessing, updating and destroying them. And interoperability is a, is a problem between different providers in different areas. Um, we heard about the excellent systems that Salford have, um, and in Cambridge um, we have well-developed electronic patient records in secondary care, but obviously there are some areas of the country that, that aren't so well-resourced, and, and so actually providing resources and interoperability training and all that sort of thing is very important. And I've mentioned the direct-to-consumer market here too. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So the second area of work I want to, to, um, to, to talk about this morning is the EPIC CVD project, which was some work that we took forward um, within the foundation, which was really focusing in on the ethical and, and sorry, the, the legal and regulatory aspects of genotyping. Um, so, instead of looking specific, specifically at the UK, we also examined national legislation um, across a number of um, member states. So, France, Germany, um, and the Netherlands, <coughs> specifically. And we held a, a workshop um, earlier this year um, where we invited a, a number of academic lawyers and cardiologists and policy makers, specifically looking at how consent, data protection, and um, device regulation impact on the way that risk stratification would be, uh, could, could be developed and implemented. And whilst we concluded that there were no absolute impediments to the inclusion of genomic information for um, for risk stratification in populations. Um, it was clear when we, that our delegates didn't understand that the in vitro diagnostic devices regulation um, will impact on the, um, the algorithms and will probably Im impact on the devices mm -hmm. that they're using um, as part of risk stratification. So, it was also clear from the, the um, representations that we had from, particularly from France and from Germany, that um, direct consumer, um, it, it, if risk stratification takes place within a direct consumer um, service, uh, then national laws prevent the genotypic information from being used. So in France, for example, um, Genetic information, um, there are very strict controls on how genetic information is used, and um, direct consumer testing is illegal. There's also a lack of clarity about whether the revised um, in vitro diagnostic devices regulation will apply to standalone software and the extent to which it will apply. Um, and the MRA, MHRA don't have specific guidance on this, but I know it's something that they are um, taking forward as part of these trilogue um, negotiations that I mentioned. So the advantage of the um, in vitro diagnostic devices regulation is that there will be more clarity about 
how software will be affected by this regulation, but it's likely that it will have an increased scope and manufacturers and developers of software and algorithms will, will have to go through a number of um, procedural steps, so they'll have to show um, conformity <coughs> assessments and performance evaluations to demonstrate the utility of, of the algorithms that they use. So finally, I just want to turn to some of the issues around M Health um, and some some of the um, some of the aspects that are incorporated within the, within this sort of wider assessment of ethical, legal, and social aspects. And of the, the, this graph comes from um, an Economist report last year, which suggested that. Um, within a survey that greater patient access to medical information could dramatically improve health out outcomes and will allow individuals to make better decisions about their health and the sorts of things that Hillary um, mentioned earlier. And so there was support for those, those sorts of um, statements. But similarly, there were concerns that um, the wider use of um, data from um, mobile phones could allow people to misinterpret their data and make poor decisions, but also um, very critically exposed them to um, worries about data privacy and data security. And just going back to the in vitro diagnostic devices regulation again, um, I think what the foundation has been um, pushing for is a more proportionate approach um, within European law, both for um, companion diagnostics, but also for the way that genetic tests are regulated. So these, this would include genetic tests that inform the genotypic element of a device that's used <coughs> in stratification. Um, there's a, been a lot of debate about the definition of companion diagnostic um, within the various versions of the in vitro diagnostic devices regulation and um, there's an ongoing need for a specific definition that limits the companion diagnostic um, to a small subset of devices that are gatekeepers for the sort of advanced therapies that we've heard about um, earlier this morning. And these the um, implementation of stratified medicine will be, in part, dependent on getting some um, getting a, a, a context within the EU in which you can actually use these tests um, in the ways that we've we've heard about this morning. So, in summary, then. Um, I think stratification engages with a number of different legal and regulatory areas. Um, I've described some of the most important areas I, that I think are data protection and in and, and relation to in vitro diagnostic devices. I think the planned um, European regulatory reforms are highly relevant, um, especially in the longer term. If we're lucky, the final versions of the EU reforms um, are likely to be finalised within the next six, six months, but there's likely to be a transitional period of five years um, while industry and healthcare sort of accommodate those changes. So the impact's likely to be delayed for a few years, but I think in the short term, the immediate problems and challenges are around securing um, robust and trustworthy data sharing um, and that's both for clinical care but also for research so I think that's all I want to say thank you very much